Today, uh, we are, the next talk is going to be Hannah Eisenman. Uh, she is studying data visualization at CUNY. She'll be presenting a talk called Plotting with Matt Plotlib. Um, we'll be going through uh, the tutorial on uh, creating publication quality um, animated and interactive figures using Matt Plotlib. Yeah, hello folks, I'm Hannah. Um, I'm a map while living in Taylor since 2016. I'm the community manager, um, and I'm a grad student studying this. So that's just my point of view for this talk. My goal here, because this is only 90 minutes, is I'm, there's only so much you can teach, right? Um, my, get, my goal here very much is to get you familiar with the Mapolid object model because if you can understand the Mapolid object model, it opens up the door to kind of do whatever you want with the library. So once you understand that, um, and that's kind of where the bulk of the static work is going to be, and then when we go into animated, it will be a more of like, okay, now how do we change that object, those objects? to so update it so we can animate things, and then how do we, and it interactive is more of the same. And that's, again, why the focus of this talk will be on explaining the map of the object model, because the object model is also the conceptual underpinning. So how many of you have used ggplot? How many of you are very confused when you move from ggplot to mapolip? <laughs> yes, this is because ggplot was designed by statisticians for statistical data. And it uses the language of academic visualization in its paradigms. Matplotlib was designed by scientists coming from a computer graphics framework. And so it's using the language of computer graphics in a lot of how it thinks about the visualizations, how it thinks about how you change things. Um, and so that's where, and so like I said, what I wanted to hear is help you learn to speak Matplotlib. Um, the, there's a lot. The repo is here. It has um, semi blank out notebooks on the top level, solutions in, the, um, in a folder. It should work on code spaces because the repo is in there, but also the first two notebooks, all they use is regular Matplotlib, so they will work in any environment where you can import Matplotlib. Um, and then the last notebook is the only one that needs another and what's another couple of libraries for kind of faster, um, easy interactivity. So, um, how many of y'all are set up? Okay. Yeah? Okay, you all are set up. So can I give you all like two, three minutes to have a working up on notebook? And I will say, I understand if some of you don't want to like follow along um, typing and you just want to watch this, totally understandable. Again, it's 90 minutes. My goal here is primarily to help you understand how MapLib thinks of things so that you can go into our documentation and find the thing and also so you can learn kind of what the library does. Um, I mentioned so this earlier, but um, if you if you decide to, if you're not sure if you're gonna stay or not, I ask that you sit in the back just so that you don't um, interrupt the flow of folks who are in front of you. Okay. So. Folks, ready to get started? I have way too much going on. Okay, so what we're gonna do for this tutorial is we're gonna use the Palmer Penguins data set. The reason we use the Palmer Penguins data set in this tutorial is because it is a multivariate data set that is small enough to be usable in a tutorial and not too small that it's trivial. Um, and, again, and because it's multivariate, we can show kind of the visualization challenges that come with trying to visualize different types of data types. Um, it's also now being commonly used in education. The Palmer Penguins data set is a data set of the, actually, how many of you have seen it already? Some of you, okay. yeah, it's a data set that has, shows you the characteristics of male and female penguins on, uh, of three species 
on three islands. So the first step of any, and this is way too small, and I know this is way too small. You, no one's seeing this code, right? Which, my goal here is that you use your time well. If you cannot see something, or cannot hear something, or cannot understand what I'm saying, please let me know, find a paper to throw at me, you know, just get my attention. Because, you trying to stare at the screen isn't going to help anyone. But I will say again, the notebooks are in the repo, so you can follow along there if that is more accessible to you. So, step one. Um, I know what I suppose I should do. Um, I should definitely done this beforehand um, to just like hide all my toolbars. Does anyone remember how you can hide all of them? Quickly? No. Okay. I'll do it the other way. Um, in a browser that doesn't have as much on the top. And, okay, so you're all clearly learning my browser preferences right now. And that Jupyter hates Jupyter hates. Okay, never mind. Let's not waste much time on that. Um, so the first thing we do is we import our libraries, we import pandas SPD, we import um, maplotlib.pyplotsplt. This is the convention you will find everywhere, um, mostly, so we're going to stick with it so that basically you can read all of this code interchangeably. We're using pandas. Why do you think we're using pandas? The data is a CSV file. Yeah, the fa yep, pandas are what you use to read a CSV file. What stuff am I going to use? What command are we using in pandas? Read CSV. There, is a, there used to be a stat, right? 90% of Kaggle entries had read CSV. Only thing they use in pandas, but... Um, so we load, our, we load our libraries, we load in our data set, we get... We're not actually loaded. And I said this, but of course, what's this? Did I do something terrible? Give it to me. Oh, because I'm in the wrong notebook, of course I don't. Um, okay, load the data, load the data set. We do df.info, the reason is, is because we want to know what the data types are of our variable, we're trying to plot them because that is where you will run into lots of issues. Um, and here I'm cleaning it just to make, again, for the sake of the tutorial working cleanly. For, for the sake of not having spent 30 minutes on dealing with missing data in the tutorial. Um, so the first thing we do in MapLive is we create a figure and we create an axis. What are these things? The best way to think about it is that figure, it's like the whiteboard. You see my giant drawing space? I can put all the things on it. So that's the map of the figure. It is the canvas, it is the drawing area, it is the thing you will layer all of your visualizations on. So big thing, figure. Now what's this thing with numbers? That is the axis. The, and so the figure is an object. And then the axes are objects that go inside figures. And the axis is the plotting bit region or the visual unit. Like if you think of a chart, like think of a visualization. Like if you think of a visualization, um, I'm looking for a whiteboard marker, of course. Yeah, that side, over that side. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If I've got this visualization, how many charts is that? One. How many charts is that? When you think about this, like for a paper or publication, is that do you think of that as one or two? One. one. What about if I then put this on it? Is 
fill one. What do all of these visual idioms, these child types, visual idioms, visual albums, pick your name for these things, what do we, all of these have in common? The same axis, right? So this is plot one, this is plot two, this is plot three. I have a question. If I start here, and I am starting with this, right? Is that the same chart? What do these two in things have in common? Axis. So in map only the axis object, AX, AX, ES, is the plotting region. It is the plotting region associated with one set of X and Y or polar axes. It is the plotting region where everything goes to that same set of coordinate transforms. So, and that's important because that's how you think about like, if I want to plot multiple on the same axis, and the same thing, right, if you do any visuals, right? Do they get, that, do, they get do all these plots go on the same axis, or do they start going to separate ones? So map lib, that is the axis object. And axis object, and how many axes do I have on, board, on this board? Does it look like, do you think there's a limit to how many axes I can fit on this board? Same thing in map lib. I mean, the memory will die first, but axes go on a figure object. They go on that canvas, you can kind of layer as many as you need within, you know, printable, computable reader. Um, reason. Now, because we don't like anybody, does anybody know what we, this is called? How do we spell this? Yep. And that's how live. These are the axis objects, AXIS, and this whole thing is the axis object, AXES. Again, I said. <laughs> Um, no, actually, we love abuses, of course. This is because, of course, in math, these are called the axes, and that is called the axes, and no one thought of No one was really considering how hard that is to actually communicate um, vocally, you know, instructionally to users. So, axes have axes, and we plot data on them. All of the, would you believe me if I told you all of these things have the same parent object? Yeah, um, so in Math.lib, the parent object is the, oh, here, I can actually tell you this way. Here's type fig, actually this probably will not tell you, let me see this one. Um, type at. <coughs> so, okay, then. Um, these are all artist objects. In Mapple Lib, the base object is called the artist, and that is the parent object for any visual element you see rendered in that graph, or in that figure. It is the axis lines, it is the plot, it is the figure itself, it is the canvas, it is the axis, it is labels, it is ticks. All of those things are children of the artist class. And the reason this is important is because, again, it's like, what can you do with the visual elements? You can do anything that is aimed fit on either that child class or that parent class. And I'm stressing again and again that it's all, everything's an object. It is very, very object oriented in terms of how you work with it when you play map or lip. So, and I say this, what's the first thing, right? We are going to add an image. Here, we're gonna add our plot of our histogram, right? This plot, not from our matrix. This is the flipper length, the bill length. These are three columns in our data, in our data set. The command is pcolor mesh, where pcolor mesh is um, a heat map type algorithm that takes each element in the, each um, cell in your matrix, and it colors it. 
And the reason I'm using peak color mesh and not like in show or match show is because peak color mesh will also stretch. In this case, it's a three column array. And I can show you what I mean by that um, if I do in show. See, no auto stretch. Very annoying. Um, and this is going to be my, let me show you. Um, I'm going to take one side trip to mapwallet.org to show you our plot types gallery. If you want a brief overview of what we, visualizations we support, types we support, though, these aren't all of the ones we support, but we try to kind of have a comprehensive listing and a, to both have a comprehensive listing and to kind of link you to other simulated methods that we don't list here, but we'll do, uh, you know, like it's this method, but with the variables a little bit different. So that is our array okay, that, that is our um, plot type gallery. Um, and, I will, and again, I'm going to keep stressing this. If it's not in there, we can still make it. It just takes a little bit more work because then you have to work with um, the build. The, the, those charts are all made up of artists, and you can go into those directly to make the visualizations you need if you're looking for more theoretical. If you're either using a visualization that type that we do not have, or you're you know a researcher developing a new visualization type. Um, I will say also, lots of people build third-party packages on top of MapPolit where they implement only specific visualizations. So. Okay, the thing I've been on about, about artists, this is where it comes in handy. We want to get a color ball, right? Because we can't label anything in our visualization. Because we haven't labeled anything, do you know what any of this means? Do you know what the color means? No, right? So what we want to do is we want to add a color ball. The way we can do that is we grab the image, which is we grab the object out of that plot, which is the image artist, which is in this case a scalar mappable type artist. And that artist we can pass into the color bar method to then make a color bar that pulls its colors and its labeling from that image. So that's kind of how your, ima your information just passes through. Um, again, we'll read it from somewhere else. And this is how you ensure that your color bar stays synced to your image as you change it. Because the thing is, is things are dynamic. I can, I can decide, for reasons I don't quite remember, um, I can decide that instead this is my data for that image. Uh, okay, I forgot the exact method, of course. Don't do things live. Um, but you can change things on demand dynamically, and this is what lets you, that color ball, be aware of it. Um, okay, so fun feature we have, we can, if you're using Jupyter, we can print you a copy of the color bars in the notebook as you need, and this is kind of a quick way to scan color bars, see if you like them. Um, how, cause, well, do you want to try different colors? What kind of colors would you want to see on this? Let's do red. Set our color map to red. Um, and but basically, you can use any string name for a color map as long as it's in our registry. So now we, pa we pass that in as an argument to be color mesh. And now we have a red table of properties of our sequence. If we don't like how these things are getting mapped, well, like, I don't want it 25 to 250, right? I want it shorter. In MapWallet, that's what's called the normalization system. So the normalization system is how we go from value to, from data value to a zero to one scale that will look into the color lookup table to get out the color. So what we can do here is we can, most of these methods will let me just 
do what's called the built-in normalization, which is uh, setting the min and the max for that remapping. And that's what I can do here, just as passing in. You can also do more advanced things with norm objects, and I'll show a little example of that later, but um, again, you can kind of customize as needed. So how do we label things? Again, remember how I said everything is an object? Well, axis objects, like the axis, and like the color bar axis, have all of these special methods on them that let you set things. So you can set the ticks, you can set the labels, and with using methods, name set x ticks set label. So here we label the axis and we label the ticks so that now I can know which column is which. The bill length, bill depth, flip the length, um, color ball. And I have a question for you. If the way I label things is like set x ticks and set x ticks labels and the way I set the color bar set cx that set label, how do you think we can label the y-axis? What do you think the method would be called to label the y-axis? On um, how many of you use not public? Okay, so folks, yeah, what do you think we use to label the y-axis? Yeah, AX upset Y. Okay, AX upset Y label. What is our Y label here? Anyways. And how do you think, and what do you think we, we can do if we want to clear off the text because we don't really actually care that it's the 300 penguin? If the method for the x-axis, if the method for the x ticks is set x ticks, what do you think the method is to clear the y ticks? Set y ticks. Um, yep, and it's set y ticks to an empty list. And again, you can get fan so we have these out of the box methods like just setting with numbers. You can also get fancier and use what are called our locator and format objects found in the ticker module. And the locator objects let you give you all kinds of tools for placing the text. The formatter objects give you all kinds of tools for how you want to write the text. Because again, the ticks are what type of object? Artists, yeah. Um, simply they're tick objects. Um, which means actually the ticks themselves, you can do tick, tick, dot, set, and you can tag on each individual tick. On each individual tick, you can set its properties. Um, which is also why it takes so long to plot these. Um, okay, so let's add another chart. So we have this really cool method called subplot list data, and it lets us do semantic chart organization, semantic figure composition, which means here, like I can name my I can name my axes, and I can name and I can put them in a list where I want them relative to each other, and when I do that, I can um, I then have returns a dictionary of of the axis objects that I can then manipulate. So here I'm just using it to create a heat map and a scatter because I don't want to lose track of these as we keep going in this tutorial. But where it gets fun is it can also do more complex things. Like if you want one double wide, you can, I mean, you can pass in ratios as arguments. You can also just double up the, uh, the heat map. And if you double it up, you will get that. If you double it up, it'll now be double wide. If you want the blank axis in between, you put a dot. Um, and this supports nesting. So you can build out these complicated um, compositions and lists and then nest them inside other lists. I will say again, as things get more complicated, what we also have are subfigures. So you may want to sometimes use 
two or three nested subfigures with each of them having a complex artist composition um, rather than a nested. So you may want to do that instead of doing the nested um, subplot mosaics, kind of depending on your needs. Um, and the, the reason for this goes down, boils down to sub-figure objects, including sub-figures, all the things you can save out. You cannot save out an axis. Give or take. Um, I say that give or take, what I think what really happens is you can write an object that will either act on an independent fit, you can write a, what, the real thing is that you actually have to create a figure to save it out, but you can write a method that will act on the figure and the subfigure, and that's identical. So your fig creation method that you do all your planning on, you can either pass in a figure that you can then save out, or you can pass in a subfigure. That's part of a bigger figure. Um, so, so we're adding that. Okay. Oh, this was supposed to be blanked out, but of course it was. Um, let's pretend that's not there. How do you think we add another plot type or another axis? Add it to the list. Yep, add it to the list. We add a bar. So now I have space for three. And how do you all think we add? I totally skimmed through this scatter plot, didn't I? Okay, sorry about that. So. We, in this one, we add a scatter. Again, the way this works is you add the plotting method dot scatter onto the axis. Um, you pass in the arguments. Scatter is particularly one of those where you can kind of encode every variable. So here we're going to encode the length of the, the x and the y as the build length and build depth, the size as the flipper length, the color as the categorical, categorical colors. So here we're just using that pandas will auto do that conversion from categorical to a code text. Because color doesn't take strings. Uh, color doesn't take categorical strings, it takes straight colors. Um, and then we, here we're using the data keyword, um, data equals df, and the convenience of this, using this keyword is that it will do the dictionary unpacking for you, so if you want to switch up your variables, you can just switch where the strings are. So, what I mean is, how do you think, if I want to switch which one is on VX and Y, how do you think I should change it? So, what should this one be then? Now we'll have our x and our y in a different. This so now we flip, which is our x and our y. So that it's one of those kind of quick ways. Or if you want to just kind of keep switching through which what you want to plot, um, it's ways to do that. Um, this sc legend element is because here I didn't explicitly name my colors, right? Like I didn't explicitly pass in labels to tell you my colors. So what I can do is I can use this SC legend elements function to kind of gather this info. I could, it will say gather the um, legend, the info you want to put in a legend. Like in this case, the colors, it, you can also use it to grab the size because if you were doing a scatter plot where each size dot is a different dot, and then you can use that legend elements to make that, to make, to build your legend. Um, that we don't have to go right now. Okay, so, Bob. And so this is what I want to give you all like five, ten minutes to do to add a bar chart. Okay? And I'll can walk around while we do that. Which I know the rec hello recording, recorded does not work so well.
Oh, and no big bits in the hack and yet. Please do write in there kind of what you want to talk about or tell me to, because again, very small group. I may as well. What's up? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and as a again, as a reminder, the notebooks are all in the repo. <coughs> um, I'm sorry. When you say like, why, where can I access the notebooks? Um, the repo pi, my username so six four five slash pi data underscore nyc okay. underscore twenty twenty p. Yeah. So and after this story, I'll clean that up. Um, what? So yeah, I can read that. Also, I have the solution notebooks, too. Yeah, so there's, uh, um, and they're in a folder solutions. Um, Oh, yeah, we're on N1 static. Yeah, and I am sorry for so much cut and paste here. Again, function of structure. Um, Whatever questions you have, you know, please ask. That's why I'm here. I'm totally comfortable with this being used half as often as hours if you have map all the questions. If you couldn't get code spaces to work, I will tell you that everything should work in Colab. Um, if you just need an environment to um, work in. But now, sorry about that. Oh, and actually what Colab will let you do is open a notebook from GitHub so you can drop in the URL and open the notebooks that way to just start working on them. So in this case, like if I
در رو میشه شده Um, if you can't find the folder, what you can, if you can't find the data folder, what you can do is pd.read, pd and you can put in the URL for your file. If you just put in the URL for um, data, uh, if you put on with a CSV and you do the URL, you can load that into the notebook. You can pass in. URL and it should work. I said that. That too. Yeah, I'm trying to remember though, there used to be a way you could just do it your Okay. Yeah, the, oh, and common language is also in C1, so you can get it that way. Um, but, yeah, just put in the tool. Um, okay, how are folks doing otherwise? Wait. Yes. Um, okay, how are you all doing? Thank <laughs> you. 
of doing this is good enough. Okay, my timing is going to completely run away from me if I don't come back here. So, how are you all feeling? Um, so, if I want to add a bar chart, how should I add a bar chart? Plotting that method is for bar. That bar. So we can do axd dot scatter axd dot bar dot bar. And what should we plot there? Do we know? We have any so if we don't know what a method takes, that's where we can go to our um, documentation and let's look up the bar method. The bar takes an x position and a height. So, for this data set, what's our x? Yeah, we can do what? Yeah, the categorical. We can read out the species or if we've been t doing our heat map and we just want to like kind of do some statistics on that, what could our categories be? Yeah, like the existing category segment data, they can also be, and that, cause that's kind of what I've been using, is the column names, right? If we're plotting statistics on three columns and the column teams would be our X. And what 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 do we want to file Y? What's an easy summary statistic we might want to plot about our data? Count? Okay. Well we know our counts though. Do we know our counts? I should ask that do we know our counts? Yeah, there's equal numbers of each penguin type. We sort of did that in the first place. What else might we want to know? Average. 
average, yeah, let's do the average. So the first thing then we'll plot is we'll plot the categories. Um, so Matplotlib will let you pass in categorical data, which means we can plot in passing our categories directly as an X. And we can, and then we can subset our data set and take the mean, and that can be our Y. Of course, nothing. What in the world? Oh. Apparently, oh, I can now wait. Oh. Don't start changing things while you go there. Okay. Typos. Yeah. So we now can pass in now. Mean. And so we've got, you know, our three linked, our three charts all showing different views on the same data set. Um, what don't we like here? Color of the bars. How do you think we can change that? So let's go to our documentation. Let's go to bar, and here are all of the parameters. Height, width, bottom, align, and then the other parameters that are passed through to, again, the underlying object. In this case, bar is made up of these, what are called patch objects, which means that the bar can take any argument that you can pass through to the underlying object. And you will see this, again, all over the place in Matplotlib. Uh, when we're like, you can pass through, um, the other parameters are the keywords and the pass-throughs, it's always a like, pass-through to the underlying, um, what we call primitive artist object. These are kind of your standard, your basic visual marks, your dot, your line, your area, your image. So those, those are kind of the four core fundamental primitives in MacroLib and the way they are um, phrase is that the dots are what's called a path collection. Um, the line, every line you have to live is a line to D object or line collection. And any the, the, like area thing you see like a bar, etc., is what's called a path or a patch object. So those are our primitive types, which again. Um, I'm going to keep stressing this because in visualization, things are either 0D the dot, 1D the line, 2D the area, or the heat map, which is your image, which you can kind of say that, but we think of this a little bit differently. So this is the path collection, path collection, this is a line 2D. This is a patch, and this is an axis image. And the reason I'm going to keep stressing this, I say this, there's also like the contour set, um, the contour stuff, depending on what you're going with. But the reason I keep stressing this is because, like, when you do a line plot, that's underneath, that's what it's using. It's using a line object. And so if you want to customize things, animate things, make things interactive, that's the level you'll be interacting with that plot at is the things that make it up. The, um, and here, so going to here to customize the bars, we can customize the bars in any ways in which we can customize our patches. So color. So let's change the color. What color should we change it to? What else might we want to do with color here? We can do yellow.
And you see I'm passing in a list. So if you pass in a list of cut loads equal to the number of elements you're plotting, you can color each chunk. And we have, and that again, like with scatter, that's what you're seeing, that like each dot is size and colored according to its element. Um, so lots of that is I will let you do that automatically. And so, Let's go to animated. So again, we're going to start a thing. Our data set. And actually, I'm going to, like, what's one way we might want to animate this? I'm going to use the same code again. And the reason I use the same code for all three of these is, like, I know this is not the most compelling animation. But my goal here is that if we keep using the same code, it will be easier to isolate what is just the addition. So we make our same base chart um, here that we know all too well. Um, all I did is I rearranged things just to make them fit a little better. Remember how I said mosaic lets us kind of move things around in a very custom way? So here I'm going to make the heat map take up the entire right side. Um, so same plot. What's a thing you when you have this kind of like linked view, right? Because all three of these are showing the same thing. What might you want to do with a linked view? If you're building a dashboard or you're doing a scientific paper, and you have three charts, and they're showing kind of different aspects of the same thing. What might be a thing that you really want to be able to show? The elements moving into place. The elements moving into place, or like the individual elements. Like, okay, uh, let's say This is a list of penguins. Those dots each represent the penguin. This is the mean of all the penguins. What might I want to know about this one and the bar chart, the heat map, and the scatter. And I'm sorry, I end up biased towards this side, but you all, same question. Um, what might I want to know between the heat map and the bar chart and the scatter plot here? Penguin here, right? What's our penguin's name? Joe. Joe? Okay, Joe is number 150 here. What might I want to know about Joe in the scatter plot? The stats. Well, what's the thing? Do I know what Joe is in there? Do I maybe want to find out? And do I want to know any stats, right? So I have a bar chart here. Do I want to know maybe how Joe compares? So, <laughs> so yes. So let it let us plot Joe, and so that's what we're doing here. In the next set, we are plotting Joe. So again, the same base. We do not change. Like, right? We're going to make a heat map. We're going to make our matrix our heat map. We're going to make our scatter plot and we're going to make our bar chart. And then we're going to layer. Because again, if you want to add things to an, out, to an axis, you just plot on top of the axis. MapLib is fine with like, you can have a line chart and a bar chart and a scatter chart and whatever else you want on the same chart, as long as they all are in the same coordinate system. And the truth is you can plot them with the non same coordinate system, you're just going to get a very wonky chart. Um, so with the assumption that you're plotting in the same coordinate system, you can put, and I say this because the other thing you can do and for advanced users is you can add a second scale to the same chart. So if I wanted to, I could plot like Fahrenheit and Celsius on the same chart, 
where Fahrenheit is on the left and Celsius on the right. So that's, yeah. But so here we plot. And so what we're going to do is, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to grab one random penguin. We're going to find Joe. Joe is a random number in that data frame. Um, and we're going to plot Joe on the heat map. What we do is we plot, we add here to the heat map a horizontal line at Joe's position. So that's Joe. So how do you think we can then circle Joe, on, find Joe on the scatter plot? What do we want to do to the scatter plot to find Joe? Yeah. So we go to the scatter. What do we? How do we? What do we plot to find to a scatter? Dot scatter. Now here's a cheat sheet. The only thing that changes is Joe, right? So what you can do is you can use all of the same long code we've already done here. Um, the only thing we need to change is we need to now, we're going to have to find, we're going to have to actually find out Joe's species to get him the right code. And we can change the data. If we change the data that feeds this, we can just do Joe. And we don't have to change any of the rest of that code. Again, except for, so what do you think, so what do you think the data is here if we want to just plot Joe? Penguins. Yeah. And here, actually, let's let's just make this thing about circling Joe, so we don't have to worry about color for a second. Um, it's a little bit tricky here because of how because I'm using cat codes and stuff. But so, um, and of course, this is what you want to do, basic. Okay. Yeah. So. What we did is we changed the data set to penguin. And I'm going to change the edge color to red. And I'm going to change the line width to 2 so we can very much see him. And that's Joe.